So, dear guests, we're now at the final panel. And there's no coincidence that we started, decided to have Afghanistan in the spotlight as the last session, because I figured there would be a lot of interest. So I'm very happy to see you all here. Uh, we have asked Ingeborg Solon Gisladóttir, our former uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Iceland, to, uh, to navigate us through the next panel. Uh, she is also the former director of the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and you've seen her here on stage before today. She has two distinguished panelists with her, and I now leave it in the very capable hands of Ingeborg Solon to take over. Thank you, Pia. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have the honor and the privilege to moderate this discussion here with two uh, renowned, esteemed Afghan women's rights activists. Uh, one of them, Mukhbaba Siraj, I've known for a long time. Yes. And she is, uh, just to tell you, uh, she's a kind of a legendary person when it comes to women's rights uh, work in Afghanistan. Everybody knows Mukhbaba Siraj. <laughs> Thank you. She's been around for quite a long time. She, uh, and I, I'm not going through, you know, the organizations that she has been working with, uh, but uh, she is uh, still in Afghanistan. She left in the former Taliban rule. She came back and she was working from 2003 in the country. Yeah. And she decided in the second after the second takeover of the Taliban in 2021, two years ago, yeah. to stay on in, in the country. So she is still there, working from, from there. And then we have uh, Pastana Durani, who is from a different generation. There's a two generations of okay. women, uh, uh, women's rights activists. She is a feminist, she's an activist, she's an educator. Uh, and uh, she, she uh, has been working in, in Afghanistan. She founded a, uh, an organization called LEARN, which is the country's first ever digital school network. When the Taliban took over two years ago, she, she left, but she continued doing her work with, with LEARN. And now maybe I will start by asking you, because you are both continuing with your work, one in Afghanistan, other outside Afghanistan, how do you go about your work? How do you do your, your work? Mahbuba. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really very happy to be here. Thank you for everyone that has stayed and wanted to listen to us. I'm honored to be a guest of this uh, forum. And I, I thank you for also inviting me to come here. Uh, I have been a women's rights activist for the past more than 20 years of my life, about 22 years to, to actually do. And, and I, I do call myself uh, really a person that has, a, you know, has lived the history of Afghanistan. Because I have been in Afghanistan, I've been involved with the women of Afghanistan for a very long time. And the first time that the reason why I had to leave Afghanistan with my family, it was 1978 when the uh, communist regime took over Afghanistan and we, had to, we, had to, we were forced to leave the country. Uh, I've been outside in, in, in uh, exile and I went to the United States. And in 2003, I came back to Afghanistan. And since 2003, I have been in Afghanistan and working with women and children. With their education, with their rights, with everything. I mean, I've been involved in so many different ways with the women and children in Afghanistan. Right now, after the Taliban takeover in August of 2021, the life and the, the lives of the Afghan women has changed 100% completely. The life in Afghanistan has changed also, but not as much as you can see it in the lives of the women. The lives of the women has changed completely. And uh, for that matter, they are, not, they are not doing the same things that they were doing before. In other words, they are not the ones that were going to school or to university or had a job or whatever. They are not doing any of that. Uh, they are staying mostly home um, because they cannot get out without a mahram. And they are, uh, some of them 
or, or doing, you know, learning some skills and things. I'm sure that they are going to some classes, but even those classes are, are no longer in existence because they have closed that also for them. Uh, they don't have the right to go, for example, even the, for the women of Afghanistan, even the right to go to the, uh, to, to a hammam is, is to a place, you know, a, a, a bathhouse. Has been, has been taken away from them. They don't have the right to do that either. They cannot go to a bathhouse. The women of Afghanistan right now in the summer, it was very hot. So a lot of people were, ta were going with their families to go and, and be someplace with, in nature and underneath a shade of a tree and sit, sit there and enjoy a day with their families. They were not allowed. If there were two families entering one of these places, you know, uh, a beautiful place, you know, for for a picnic place, then the family that was there, all men, he was allowed, to, they were allowed to go, but the family that had women with them, they were not allowed to go. Uh, the same way in, 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 in so many, in so many ways, you know, the right has been taken away from them. The right to education is one of those things that just the, and, and I'm sure, you know, you ladies, you cannot imagine, you know, what is the feeling of a young girl when she was going to school and she could, uh, and suddenly that right is taken away from them and they just can't do it anymore. And they say, no, you cannot. I mean, I mean the disappointment, you know, what they go through uh, emotionally and mentally and psychologically is the most horrible thing. Most of these young, young girls, they have gotten completely, um, they, they are, they've gone into, under depressions because of that. They are not well at all. So life is really becoming extremely, extremely hard for the women of Afghanistan. And then also there is the question of, of uh, economic difficulties. Economic difficulties in the sense that the, there's no food to buy. So, <coughs> or they don't have any money. <coughs> I'm not saying that there's no food because there is, but they don't have the power to go and buy it in the stores. So they cannot do that. Going to the, to the hospital and to the doctors and, and seeing nurses, and, 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 and nurses are not working all of them that they were supposed to be working because they are not allowed. Um, uh, and all of this is happening in Afghanistan and the news is not getting anywhere. Because, because the media is completely you know, stopped and they're not giving any news out. So the whole thing is like becoming the Afghanistan that you knew, you know, the woman, when she was there, uh, Ingeborg was there, she was, you know, she saw all of us, we were all working, the woman were going to the parliament, the other women were working, because now they're not allowed to, have to go to the offices and work either. So all of these things have been taken away from them. So when you, when you enter Afghanistan right now, life is extremely, it's a bunch of very sad, sad people in general. You cannot hear the, the, the sound of music because music is not allowed. And the, before Afghans, they really are, they're happy people. They, they were having a lot of music and everything. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the woman, or not, or not going anywhere, or doing anything that they used to. So this is this is where we are as the women of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That's a bleak picture. Right. But you tell me one, maybe you know, just <coughs> elaborate a little bit on, on on that because in Afghanistan previously, you know, we, we, the, the uh, international invo involvement for twenty years made a lot of difference for Afghan women in the cities, especially. Yeah. But women, in the, the poor women in the countryside, it actually maybe has not made so much difference for them who has been in power. But how is it now for them? Is it the situation more difficult? Is it more dire than it used to be? Well, yeah, in a way it is for them also. Although, although in, in, in general, it really has not changed very much. Because most of them, the ones that were not going to school, so for them, you know, they were not. But there were a lot of women that they were going to school, actually. They had started to do that all over Afghanistan. But the fact remains that the whole, the whole um, uh, how shall I say, development for the women of Afghanistan, it was extremely unbalanced because the ones that they were in the, 
in the, not in the big cities, they were in the provinces of Afghanistan or in the villages of Afghanistan. They were not getting what they were supposed to, the women in the, in the big cities or in Kabul or in Kandahar or Mazar or Herat were getting it. And that was the way actually uh, that the whole aid and, 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 and the help that was given to the women of Afghanistan was distributed. And that distribution was not right. And, and we were working on it to make it more inclusive and for it to get reach more women in Afghanistan. But it, it was not. It really was not all the way. So for them, you're right, maybe to them it might not make a whole lot of difference. But, uh, but for the rest of the women in Afghanistan, of course it does. But then, you know, but then being in a country, you don't, you don't want everything to kind of a, be in a way that the way they were and nobody has access to anything and everybody's backwards. As, as the people living in a country, you always want that country to move ahead, to become better, to be a better country for the, for the people of the country to live in it. So, for me, the question has always been, or what I wanted was always that it should be a way to find a way that, that there will be more development in the country as far as that's concerned. Education, access to health, access to justice, um, freedom of choice, freedom of movement, they were all very important. And freedom of working in, 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 a, in a justice system, of course, that is for all of the women to be able to access it and will be available. Right now, there is no such a thing. There is no, it's, uh, the court system and everything is completely different. It's like, uh, not the same thing at all. Uh, Astana, how, how do you see the, the situation and how do you see the way forward for women in Afghanistan? That's a very good question to uh, open with. I mean, I'm so honored to share the stage with Mahbuba Saraj, I mean, me and my professor were talking, we were like, she was like saying that when I grow up, I want to be her. <laughs> Everybody looks up to her. Um, Thank you. Now, now, the reason I mentioned this is for some of you who might not know about Afghanistan a lot is the fact that everybody introduces Afghanistan to you in a way like women's rights were introduced in the past two decades. There were no rights before that. A <laughs> hundred years ago, Afghanistan had a women minister of education, whereas the world was still struggling with the women vote issue in the West. So uh, it's very important to see that Afghanistan is that country. Afghanistan respected women's rights. Afghanistan integrated women's rights where the West was still struggling with it. Now, when you move on from that, then you look at the way we were used as a muscle for somebody else's war. You have to acknowledge all of that. You have to acknowledge the past and then you can work on the future. So now looking at today's Afghanistan and today's generation, I'm 25. So I grew up in this Afghanistan. I, I know this Afghanistan only and Afghanistan that my father taught me, Malika Saraya, or anyone post that, or before that. So how does this, the, the six, seven years of the 90s, and how does this two years hold for me? This is not the Afghanistan I know, and this is not the Afghanistan I'm ever gonna be comfortable with. So what is the least we could do is to make sure that we all play our parts. I come from a very conservative tribal family from Maruf, Kandar, and we are the countryside people. And we are labeled by the world as in, oh, people who supported Taliban. But we're also the people who opened schools, who ran schools in secret, who ensured that their daughters go to school, who ensured that their sons enlist in military and fight against the Taliban um, with the NATO and with the US military. And my tribe lost 2,300 men to that very fight. And their widows in that countryside, their daughters are still back home. And the one thing I was taught by my father was, you're responsible for these people. And I still have this uh, weird complex around it is like, okay, this is my life. I live in Boston, I can go about my day, but then at the same time, I get a call from back home. Oh, there was an earthquake and now you have to work about the crisis. The reason I'm telling you all of this is like, there is so much pressure on Afghan women, so much pressure from all sides. We have to take care of the education because we don't have a, um, educational system or policy or constitution, by the way, and that is in place right now. We don't have a healthcare system, so we have to run underground health clinics. We have to run underground secret schools. We have to run underground civil society right now in Afghanistan. True. And we're still, we are still not at the main table to talk about our own rights. 
to talk about how to negotiate. We're still sidelined. We're only invited to the pretty forums, you know? I, as much as I love this opportunity, I would also want to be part of something that makes a framework for Afghanistan, that implements it, that ensures my safety, that I am not supposed to be smuggled back home every summer. You know, I was smuggled this summer back home, and I was there for three months, but underground, I couldn't meet my own friends. And you said, how do you work, or how do we work? So this is how we work. So when I was back home, this is a funny story, by the way, um, the salon ban happened where the women are not allowed to go to salons anymore to feel pretty or anything of that sort. Um, yeah. And do you know what we did? And the disaster can, you can see on my hairs is we all colored our hairs at home. We brought in the salon lady and we all colored our hairs at home. Do you know why? Because that's the only act of resistance we could do then. When the education ban happened two years ago, do you know what we did in Kandar, which is labeled as the most stronghold, Taliban stronghold? We started a secret school. Yeah, what kind of school? A secret school, underground school. And right now, 100 girls are getting, they were in grade seven when they started, they are in grade nine today. The same goes for Helmand, the same goes for Bamiyan. And I'm not saying this is one countryside or one province. People reach out to you from places that you wouldn't even know about, you would have never met. Do you know why? Because they all believe in women's rights, girls' rights, educational rights, all of those rights. So the story is Afghan women are working towards it. Afghan girls and women are showing up for their rights, for their future. And that's the future that we see. I personally see that in 10 years, one of my students should take over whatever we are doing right now and should hold that torch. And there should be a day where we don't need nonprofits for, to save Afghanistan, where Afghanistan doesn't need saving. You know, that's the future I envision. But in the meantime, what the best thing we could do is ensure that we invest in alternative pathways towards education, towards certifications, towards ensuring that the women who are right now getting education have able, are access to higher education, but also at the same time can go back home and serve. I go to Harvard, I wanna go back and serve. I don't wanna end up and just become one international uh, diplomat who does work internationally. No. But will this have to happen in secrecy? Will, will this have see, to be secrecy? see, that's the point. This is where I'm telling you, we are all showing up. We're all showing up. We're getting educated. We are in the preparation, you know, yeah. for this. But then, again, the radical diplomacy has to come. It has to come. It has to ensure that I'm no more a person who is to do all of this in secret. In the next 10 years, it has to be something that is done in open. I'm accepted and open because I'm not doing something illegal, not something that is not Islamic, not something that is not accepted in culture because I kid you not, you can Google me, you can see my father who used to wear a turban and he was very much a feminist. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we don't believe in it. It's just a few people holding the country hostage are ensuring that this is the only information fed to the world and this is the only future envisioned for Afghanistan. So Afghan women are showing up are you, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, uh, to be able to do all of this in open, the Taliban's have to accept it. And the question is, how do you go about dealing with the Taliban's? You know, some in the, uh, both in the, I know in the Afghan, uh, among, especially among Afghan expat women, they think we should not kind of negotiate with the Taliban's, we, we should not, the international community should not, uh, let me, of, uh, yeah. Let me tell you something. Approach the Taliban, but then there are others that think we should try to find a way to negotiate with them. What, what's your opinion on that? Let me give you an example. I always used to be so, like you know, frustrated with the fact: how come we have 40 countries fighting in our country? How come we have superpowers in our country? All the best weapons and everything, and still Taliban get to bomb blast everything. Like I used to be so frustrated about it, you know. And then this summer, I went from a, another country. I was smuggled into my own country. I, I was on somebody else's papers. I was entering the country. Those papers, that driving, that ensuring of my safety, that safe house, that ensuring of my transportation in different zones, that showed me a very secret pathway towards, oh, so Taliban had the same sort of supporters. But it doesn't mean that one, you can replace one with the other. You cannot. People like us will exist. People like us will also exist in secrets if people like Taliban are in open. And then people like us will, were in open and then the Taliban were in secret. So it has to be more of a dialogue. But then at the same time, I wouldn't expect a lot from the Taliban, 
because the, you cannot expect someone who is bombing uh, schools for the past two decades to all of a sudden accept schooling because their propaganda was, by the way, that these are infidels and they're taking our daughters and dishonoring us. So these are very different ideologies that you're working with. Where are their core values? What do they believe in? That's the most important thing. And what do you talk to that? You know, those are important things. You have to talk to Qatar. That's the important thing. That's where you push buttons. You have to talk to Pakistan. That's important. You have to talk to Iran. Radical diplomacy. Bring those people to the table. Um, Muslim countries who call them their brothers. Um, so then my question is, are we not your sisters enough? that you only stand with your Muslim brothers and not with your Muslim sisters. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring all those elements towards talking, towards a plan that is implementable. Then you can say, OK. But then you don't only negotiate with the Taliban. You bring in all the people involved in Afghanistan, because Afghanistan is not just Taliban versus the, the, these people. No. It's a very diverse country. It's a very diverse nation. And you have to respect that and bring all that together. And the world has to facilitate it because they sort of created this mess in the 80s. <laughs> so time to clean up. Mahpuba, what do you think? How do we approach these, these issues? How to get the approval of the, of the Taliban moving forward? Well, for the, in reality, in order to get the approval of the Taliban, the countries of the world that they were involved in getting us to this position, they have to step forward and come into the picture and say, OK, now we want to talk. The, and one of those countries, it is the United States. Yes. The United States is completely uh, is refusing to talk to the Taliban. They are not talking to them. OK, fine. You're not talking. And the Taliban, they were the only country in the world that they want to talk to is the United States. And for that matter, what the Taliban are doing right now, they're using the women of Afghanistan as a pawn. So that's where we are. We are political pawns. We are just playing with us. And, and that's what they are doing. So if it's really, you know, we really, uh, some things have to really change in this world. This is not the right, what is happening in Afghanistan. And this is something that was with the thinking process of countries of the world. They sat down and they thought about it. For two years, they talked about all of this, for God's sakes, in a, in a, in a peace conference in, in, in Doha. Yeah. And, and apparently, quote unquote, there were representatives there. There were only four women in that whole representation. And then, and then they, they, they came up with something. Khalil Zod was the ambassador that came up with, a, with an idea, with a, I mean, with a roadmap to, to, to peace with Taliban. Every single word that he said to us, the women of Afghanistan, and I remember I was there and I kept on asking him about this, he lied about it. Every single time he lied about it. I mean, he was representative of a country, for God's sakes. And what Sanam is, was saying is true. I mean, somebody has to actually hold them responsible. Yeah. In other words, what I'm trying to say, if we want to change anything in this world, really, which I think the time has come, and you have all realized it, as a country, as the most peaceful country in the world, you have realized it. You can imagine, the, uh, uh, you know, somebody was saying about there has no, hasn't been any war in here, any conflict in the past 200 years. Well, Afghanistan hasn't seen a peace in 45 years. We haven't. We are in constant war. It's been going on for 45 years. And, and, and this is not what is supposed to be happening. It's really not right. What happened to Afghanistan? What happened to Syria? What happened to Iraq? What happened to Libya? What happened to all of these countries? Or what is happening today in, 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 uh, uh, in Gaza? With the, with the Palestinians and Hamas and all of that. That is, that is not right. Something, something has to be done to really stop all of these things. We really have to go to the source. And the source is, we ha really have to, instead of the whole world is trying to solve uh, the uh, war, stop wars. Well, you're getting into it first, but so willingly. You're putting everything to war. That's and then you're working, you're working to stop it. What kind of a nonsense is that? Mm -hmm. Who are you trying to fool? Yourselves or the world? Or all of us? What is this? I don't get it. I really don't get it. I'm sorry. 
No, so this is a very interesting point you're raising there, because one thing is to go into a country, invade the country, see it in, in Afghanistan or Iraq or, 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 or Ukraine, or if they now go into Gaza, but going out again and solving the problems, yep. that's a, a, a totally different issue, and they don't. It doesn't solve these problems. They're Nobody. really unsolved, and even worse than they were before. Absolutely, absolutely, and they're, and they're piling up. They're piling up, and they're all continuously these wars that are happening, conflicts that are happening, and none of them are being solved. And they're piling up one on top of another. And this is the world we are living in. But you don't see it as a, a, a recognition of the Taliban's, uh, the government and the ideology of the Taliban? You know, a community even, 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 them? No, even if it's an ideology, even if it's a recognition, whatever it is, it cannot be. Because how can the world recognize a government that that government is not recognizing half of its population, which are the women. How can you? How can they? This is not possible. The women of Afghanistan are half of the population of Afghanistan. If there's 40 million, then we are 20 million. Maybe all the 20 million are not the same, no doubt. Absolutely, I know. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that as an Afghan, I cannot, or her as an Afghan young girl cannot wish for her country to be, to be like the rest of the world, to be a country that is, is, is peaceful, is, is, is comfortable, is, there, is a, there, is, there are rights, they are, they are, they are, you can live in it comfortably, you can raise your kids, they can go to school. Why can't we? Why can't we? You know, this is, this is just in a world that is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller every single day. And because of the, you know, the way we are connected through internet and through all of this and, 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 and technology. The technology has advanced, you know, so much, especially in the, in the past 10 years, is unbelievable. You know, things are happening right now that never did happen before. And, and now is that movement is going to go on like this even more. But the one thing, you know, because I'm talking about the international community and the recognition of the Taliban, it's a really a strange fact that there are no missions, no diplomatic missions in Kabul whatsoever from the West, Western part of the world, except for the European Union. And how does that, you know, reflect on you, the, the, no, the, the, the European Union, honestly, it started in, in front of me. It was the, the ambassador that came, you know, was, was looking into the whole thing. And she, he, I, knew, I knew him. He used to be the, the Belgian ambassador in Afghanistan. He called me and said, Mabuba, come on, I really would like to talk to you. So I went over and I talked to him and I said, sir, I want to tell you one thing. Get your feet and your eyes and your ears on this land if you can. That is the way to do it. Don't bring an ambassador. It's okay. You don't have to bring an ambassador. But at any other level that you want to, you have to have your feet and you have to have your eyes and ears on here. Otherwise, you don't know what is going on in But Africa. they are the only ones. And, and, but they came. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that they came. They decided to do that. I'm forever grateful. And I think they did one of the most important things by, by doing what they did. And, 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 the, and the person that is actually running the whole mission right now, it's a lady, mm. and Isabella. And, and it's like, that's the way to do it. What, we have to start thinking outside of the box. If we don't start thinking outside of the box in the world that is coming up, we are not going to, we are not going to succeed. Mm. I can promise you that. But I guess, Mahbouba, now I'm a bit, you know, confronting you with it. I guess that there are quite a lot of Afghan women that do not agree with this. It's true. It's true. There, there are some, or quite a lot, or whatever. <laughs> I've seen, I think I've seen the brunt of that also, because they hate me. <laughs> but at the same time, you yeah. know, it's like, it's like, what am I supposed to do? I'm not saying anything bad or terrible. What I'm saying is that, for God's sakes, let's change the situation in Afghanistan. We cannot go on like this. The women of Afghanistan cannot go on like this. I'm so glad that you left Afghanistan. You're out. Very good. I'm glad. But, but for the ones that are living inside, I mean, I can get in, in and out of Afghanistan. How about the ones that can't do that? Then what happens? What are they supposed to do, die? That's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. We are just asking for what is our right. This, was, this is God's given right to all of us. 
We are not asking for anything anymore. And then Taliban, they keep, keep on coming that, oh, well, this is an internal thing. What do you mean internal? So somebody in the world, one of these countries, maybe, maybe it's Iceland, I don't know. Maybe you should come and have a talk with the Taliban and say, what are you talking about internal? What do you mean internal? You're, you, you, have you taken a part of this, this earth or not? And I'm sure they'll say yes. It's a country by the name of Afghanistan. Fine. On this earth, if you want to live on this earth and be a member of the United Nations and live with the rest of the people of the world, then there are some things that you have to agree. And, and you have to live accordingly. Otherwise, you cannot live. That's all. And we won't accept you. So you have to be, you have to be like really brave and say, it's nothing to do with you. We are not, we are not telling you this to, 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 you know, to fight you, whatever. No. We don't have any, you know, Iceland doesn't have any wars with you. But you have to do it. Pastana, you agree on this? I think for me, my approach definitely involves, yes, talking is uh, something that everybody has to do. You have to bring in all the parties in Afghanistan to talk. Um, we cannot let completely replacement every two decades. That's yeah. not sustainable for our country, especially a foreign replacement. Taliban are also a foreign replacement, by the way. One should recognize that always. But also, apart from that, you also have to look at those facts that the Taliban's own daughters are going to schools in Doha, and um, it still is okay. So I think for the Western bloc of the world, it's very important for them to not turn a blind eye on that. You should start asking questions. Why is China giving Afghanistan, um, why is China so much involved in Afghanistan right now, especially with the minerals? And still they are going sanctionless because they have veto power or whatever. Um, Pakistan does a lot of things in Afghanistan. They're lobbying for a lot of things and it's abusing Afghan refugees right now. They're still going, uh, um, turning a blind eye on that. Um, then the same time Doha, whatever Qatar did, uh, has enabled. Um, I, I was talking to someone and they were like, oh, they brought in um, the, all the female members to talk to the Taliban. T Taliban don't mind talking to a foreigner women, even if it's a, from a Muslim country. But they don't see Afghan women as their equal or as the first class citizens of Afghanistan. So you have to inform that. And if that doesn't happen, then please, you have power for sanctions. You're, you are part of the UN. You can be doing so much. You can be freezing their accounts. You are not doing that. You can be sanctioning their travels. You are not doing that. You can be sanctioning their families that are, by the way, living luxuriously. Not doing that. Enabling them to evolve as government employees, go on these diplomatic missions, be everywhere. Their daughters go to school. Their sons go to school. I just got to know that one of the Taliban's leader's son, who lives in Dubai, by the way, is enrolled in a very high prestigious university and plans to become one of the politicians in Afghanistan. So if they can dream, what about normal Afghan people, normal Afghan women, normal Afghan girls? So for me, the approach might be a bit more radical. I would say if they don't want to talk, then force them to come and talk. Mm -hmm. Force them to commit to a framework. Because if they don't, you cannot go on like this. I mean, the Herat earthquake, I don't know how many of you know about the current crisis in Afghanistan. Herat right now is going through crisis and the Taliban have just stated, oh, 2,000 people have died. Do you know how many people are actually uh, dying right now, have died? 3,700 was the morning count. They're trying to hide the numbers. 7,800 people are injured. And do you know who are the most injured, by the way, right now? Women and children, because it happened in the morning. So. Even a crisis like this is going unnoticed because the Taliban want to put their repetition and like, you know, show that, oh, they're in control. They're not. They, they, do you know healthcare system for Afghanistan, by the way, failed six, six months after Afghanistan fell? So we don't have a, a healthcare that caters to women. So you have to have clinics in secrets. <coughs> the education system, of course, has failed for the 50% and there were no alternative pathways. Um, but then at the same time, you have to have a way towards it if you really are committed to Afghanistan. If you're not, then you're gonna do what people are doing right now in Afghanistan. Go on Twitter, tweet about it. Oh, we feel sorry about Afghanistan, uh, but I won't sanction uh, the leaders who are running the country right now. Mm -hmm. I won't uh, sanction the countries that are enabling them to uh, uh, run these countries. I won't talk and dialogue with those countries that have those controls, you know, or funds them or supports them. So for me, 
the approach has to be more practical, more pragmatic, and um, if they don't want to talk, then force them to talk. Now you're talking about a little bit uh, kind of a framework, uh, 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 yeah, a rule-based framework or, 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 or international uh, approach that is similar to apartheid. When, when the international community was dealing with apartheid in mm. South Africa, yeah. you could say that in Afghanistan you have gender apartheid. Yes, we do Maybe have gender apartheid. Maybe we need to look at the, the mechanism we had in place dealing with South Africa uh, previously. Maybe they can kind of be applied uh, on this apartheid. Yeah, if it's, if it's, but this was something that I was wondering about the gender part because for South Africa, it was mainly brought for South Africa, the gender apartheid, because it was something that happened only in Africa. I don't think it happened anywhere else. So the apartheid did not exist before, before South Africa. on race. Exactly. The, uh, I mean, not the gender, no. but the race. So. No, right now, the gender apartheid in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan, they have to look at it and find, and, and whatever, the, the, the world is supposed to take some decisions to yes. do things to the government. But what really worries me, so you see, that's the whole thing. What worries me about that is that when those decisions are taken, for example, there is going to be like, you know, no more help should get to Afghanistan. No more money should get there. No more, you know, the, the sanctions are supposed to be happening, all sorts of things. So when these things do happen, then what happens is going to start hurting the people of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So when the people of Afghanistan get hurt, then, then, then what's the point? I mean, the gender apartheid is, is happening and they're accepting it, and then th th all of these actions are taken against the people of Afghanistan, and then at the end of the day, what happens is that it's going to make this whole thing a lot worse because the male of, in Afghanistan are going to start hating the female of Afghanistan. It's going to be a rift amongst the men and, you know, between the two sexes in there, and that's going to create much more, a bigger problem in the country. So that's why these are the things that, you know, if a decision has been, t has been taken on this, or if they are taking a decision on this, they have to really think about yeah. it very c uh, carefully. It's not, it's not just a, a thing that, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We have to be very aware of the consequences, because the consequences of every single one of these actions is something that the people of Afghanistan are going to be paying for it, and they are doing that right now. And, and to add on to that is like, you know, when sanctions, like Afghanistan was sanctioned, like the money was taken and everything. Here's the thing, that's a very lazy framework. That's a very lazy framework for policymakers and leaders. Oh, the best I could do is go to the UN and sanction them, the whole country. That's the most laziest framework in the 21st century you could have done to a country that is already in crisis. You cared so much about it? Well, then when you were talking for the two years, what did you do about it? Why didn't you think through it? And now that you haven't, what can you do that only affects the group, not the whole country? And that's what Afghan women have been asking for the past two uh, years is like, stop making Afghan women and Afghans in general suffer for what the Taliban have done. Make them suffer. But it's already almost the opposite, where the Taliban are not suffering, but the people are suffering. Yeah. Uh, we are almost getting to an end of this discussion, and there's one thing I want to mention before we uh, finish off, and that's a bit of a sensitive issue, uh, and that is, you know, now uh, Nargis Mohammadi got the P Nobel Peace Prize, which is really, a, a, you know, we all are so happy for the women happy. of Iran that she got this, this prize. But I know that, you know, you, uh, Makhbupa, and uh, uh, Narkis, you were nominated on the same ticket together. Yeah. And uh, when I heard uh, that you were nominated, I saw it as a nomination, not of you as individuals, but, you know, kind of representing the Afghan and Iran women. Yeah. But now it, Narkis got it, but you, you are not, not included. I'm, I'm knocking, not approaching this as a personal issue. No, I know. And, but uh, I would it's like not. to get your take on this. Yeah, the uh, it was I was we were both nominated by by Preo actually, by, you know the Norwegian uh, uh, Research Center, and 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 then and then the kit ticket was presented like that, and we were sent to the to the committee, and we were together on it, 
And I was, and from the beginning, I was, you know, I was hoping that we would both get it because of the, very simply, the situation of the Iranian woman and the Afghan woman. Both of them are terrible. And for each one of these countries, having the Nobel Peace Prize given to, the, to a woman that represents them or represents the country, it would have been such a fantastic morale boost for, for all of them, all of the Iranian women, and for that matter, for all of the Afghan women. So I was hoping that this would happen at, you know, for both of us, so we can, we can actually, for the women of both countries, it would have been wonderful. But, but it didn't. Now, this again, to me, it, it, it's, it explains that thinking out of the box that I, I want to tell you. For example, the, the Nobel Peace Prize should be looked at as what Nobel, the person that is getting it, what kind of a effect is that person going to have on the, on the, on the, on the people around, on the, on the group that, that he or she is, is representing, what kind of a thing, how they are, how they are feeling, not just because it's a Nobel Peace yeah. Prize. It's no, it's no longer important. The importance is because the world is a changed world. It's no longer the same thing as it was, a, you know, a hundred years ago, or whenever the Nobel Peace Prize started. It's a completely changing thing every single day, every single year. So right now, I was in this thing, you know, I was the two of us getting it. It would have been a new way of thinking. It would have been like, okay, you know, even if the money has to be split, who cares? It's just that that name would have been so good for both countries that they both need it. But right now, by doing it, by giving it to Iran, one thing that is proven to me is that, well, Iran is more important to the, to the world and Afghanistan is not. Okay, fine, you clearly said that to me and I, and I know it. So, but, but, but in reality, how, how it could have changed? And by doing that, and by doing that action, they don't, because they don't know me. They don't know me, how I am, who I am, what is my effect in Afghanistan. They have no idea. They would have changed so much by just having me also, with, with, with Nargis, to be getting the um, Nobel Peace Prize. Because the pride that the Afghan people were feeling about all of this was phenomenal. It really was. They were so happy that I was representing them, a part of them. And a part of them, they were very miserable that I was representing them. I know that. But that's the way, you know, things go in, in, in the world that now, for an for a, you know, activist, what else do I expect? But, but th this is how it was. But for the group that would have been, you know, they would have been very happy, it would have changed a lot of things in the country. And I, that I can, I'm, I'm absolutely positive about. First, but you feel happen. similarly? Yeah, yeah. I also think it's, um, I think it's a very political decision when you split two countries that are going to gender apartheid and you prioritize one over the other. While, yes, both are going through it, but one is going through an extreme gender apartheid. And um, as much as I, I'm so proud of the fact that Nargis got this, and I will always cherish this. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then at the same time, oh, how, how political it is, you know? For me, it is political, personally, that they didn't think it was, the Afghan issue was worthy enough to get that Nobel Prize, you know? Like, we're still not worthy enough, our suffering is not worthy enough for you to even consider our gender apartheid. Like, how cruel you can be on that, and also how political you are. So you're not like, you know, not biased, you are biased actually. Um, so you have to think about all of those things. Yeah. Um, the story is very simple. Two years ago when I was talking and everything, somebody from the State Department reached out to me and they were like, uh, we want to give you a prize. Same story. <laughs> and I was like, oh, the President Medal or something. And they're like, I was like, okay, sure. And they were like, have you talked about drone attacks? And I, I was like, yeah, I have. They're like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm always skeptical of awards and stuff like that. I do, I do think they don't have the best interest at their heart. Um, we would have felt very um, represented. Yeah. And we would have felt very seen if it was someone like Ms. Raj taking the award on our behalf, because it's history. It's Nobel, yes, I feel it. I do feel it. The reason is I want to tell my daughter someday that somebody from our country got that award. Somebody did. Mm -hmm. But now we are like, oh, our suffering was not enough, you know. Do you kind of feel, think or feel that the, oh, oh, Afghanistan is uh, 
becoming less important, less uh, remembered by the international community? I mean, it's, it's a true thing. There was a time where Afghan women's nail polish was the high talk of the whole world, the Western Bloc, and everybody was like, oh, Afghan women cannot put on nail polish, so we need to invade the country and help them do all of that. And the reason I'm being sarcastic about it is because a lot of good things also happened, but also bad things happened because of that invasion. So you can't like, you know, uh, rule it out. But now all of a sudden, Afghan women, they're not polished, their education, their healthcare, their policies, their representation, their political situation, their history, their geography. The fact that they're Afghan women is not important. And of course, the media is political, so they won't care about it. Um, the international community is extremely political, so they don't care about it. What is hot is more trending. And at the moment, we are not the sort of people that they want to rescue. But also, at the same time, I think enough is enough. They shouldn't be rescuing us. We need to make our own space, and we need to own it. But then at the same time, it, at this point, sadly, is not possible without that like, you know, community. So. But okay, let's, uh, let's forget about the international community and just focus a little bit on, uh, back on the Afghan women, what you are doing to change things. You are still going strong, you are still active, oh, yeah. you are still Definitely. in a fighting mood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing has changed. We're preparing. Yeah. We're preparing for this. Exactly. Yeah, we have a long way to go. We have to catch up with the world. But one thing I want to tell you, I belong to the generation, actually, that I raised a generation in Afghanistan. I worked for them, because I've been working 22 years in Afghanistan now. So I raised a generation. I got a generation of the young people ready, that they were the women and the girls of Afghanistan, that they were ready to work, and they did that. Today, apart from other things, we have one of the biggest brain drains yes. in that country. And that brain drain, took away all of those girls from me. And suddenly, I found myself in Afghanistan being completely alone. Yeah. And I was, at the, in those days, and I kept on talking to these girls, these women, that they were outside and saying, I wish you were next to me. But then it came a point, a time, when I, I was said, I'm so glad they are not. I really, that point also arrived. But in the beginning, believe me, I was like, I wish they would have stayed here. Because if, if we all stayed as the civil society of Afghanistan that was alive and, 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 and working, maybe we could have done something. Because right now, one other thing that is very important, the only ones standing in Afghanistan for the rights of those people are the women. I know we are doing it for our rights, but it's not only the rights of women in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We are doing it for the country. We are doing it for the, whoever is there, the men and women and children and old people and everybody. And we are the only ones left there. And the women of Afghanistan are keeping the, the name of Afghanistan alive. Yep. Otherwise, it would have been forgotten, gone, finished, and, and nobody would have, would, have, would have thought about it. Uh, the women of Afghanistan and a part of the international community and I should say, a part of the international community that realized their, their involvement in Afghanistan and the fact that they did not come through the way they should have. They really dropped us like hot potato, and they really feel very bad about that. There is a part of them that they really do feel bad about it. I'm not saying they are not. And then, of course, there is another part of it that they don't even want to hear the name of Afghanistan. If it, would, if it could just disappear, that would be so much better because, because by just us or me or a few of us, you know, being around and reminding them or her, uh, we, are not, we are not good news. Yeah. But at the same time, I want the world to remember. I don't want the world to forget it. And I make sure you don't forget it. For as long as I am alive and I can talk and people can hear, I make sure they don't forget it because this is not something that we wanted to come into it. This is not a situation that we chose to be in it. This is a situation that we were put in. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was done with completely thinking very clearly, planning, very big heads, very important people. They sat down around tables and they made a decision about the future of Afghanistan and the women of Afghanistan and everything. For 20 years and trillion, trillions of dollars, everything was, was spent. 
the, 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 the 3,000 soldiers of, of, the, of the world died, or 3,500 or 4,000. But more than 12 million Afghans died yes. of the young men. They, th that doesn't count. And it was decided, and that decision decided to do this. That's why I'm holding the world responsible right next to myself. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep, keep on doing it. But by God, I make sure that the rest of the world does it too. I really want to do that. Thank you, Makpupa. Rest assured that you are not forgotten. We will make sure that, you know, for example, the Icelandic government, the Icelandic uh, uh, authorities will continue to support you. And I know, and we will push them also to, to advocate on your behalf at the international <laughs> level. And I know there are more that will do that, definitely. But you, you are not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we just stop here. Thank you.